Okay, give me a second. Good morning. Hello, Seth. How's it going? There's technology. <laughs> we love it. Yeah, sometimes we love it. Okay. I, you're not going to use the video, is that right? No, we are going to use the video, actually, Seth. Okay, so how's my, my background is not my usual background. Here's the challenge. No worries. Challenge is that they're using a blower out the window and I want okay. to keep you from that sound. Uh, no worries. But this isn't particularly picturesque behind me. So what do you no. think? Would you like to uh, If, it, you know, a bit, a bit of lighting would there yeah, be amazing. A, a little bit of lighting will be great if you don't okay. mind. Thanks I'm very much. I'm going to just leave this running. Don't go anywhere. Perfect. No worries. Thanks, Thanks a lot. Dude. Little touch of echo, but I think we can live with that. I can go yeah. Yeah, it's we can perfect. edit that Thank out. You, no, you, it's, you know when you're dealing with a professional when they're like, there's a touch of echo and you know, people, it's like, <laughs> yeah. some people's audio is like devastating. They're like, oh, it sounds pretty sweet, doesn't it? <laughs> okay, so if you guys are happy, I'm happy. Hi. Cool. You know, obviously we've had our back and forth on, um, on email and uh, we're going to not bring up anything personal. So, you know, they, they are- oh, You they, can bring it up. I just won't answer you. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. No, no. So, uh, we well, good after afternoon there, Seth Godin. Uh, thank you so much for joining us on the Ridiculously Human podcast. It's an honor to have you as a guest on our show. Well, it's a pleasure. And I think if we added up how far each of the three of us are apart, it would be one hell of a try. Yeah, it would indeed. <laughs> <laughs> Seth, uh, Craig and I have actually both been followers of yours for such a long time. Um, we got introduced to your blog probably like five or six years ago, and you've been in our inbox sort of every day since then. So <laughs> thanks for everything that you've done and all the information that you shared. Well, it's a, it's a privilege. I would do it if no one read it, but it's nice to know that people do. Yeah, yeah, that's for sure. <laughs> Seth, just, just one thing. It seems like clear to us that uh, you have a passion for empathy and like for driving change. What's like, what, what, where does that come from for you? What, what stems it? What drives you to make those or want people to make those changes? I grew up in a great household. Uh, my mom and my dad were both makers of change. And I came to believe that everyone wanted to make change happen. Why wouldn't people want to make things better? And as a trained engineer, making things better means build a bridge that doesn't fall down or wire up some wires that make a light go on. But we also get to make change when we're a nurse or when we're making a podcast. I mean, that's what humans do. After we've fed ourselves, everything else in our day is who am I going to change and how will I make things better? And over the years, what I discovered is no matter what kind of work I was doing as a teacher or a leader, it came back to, I was trying to make a change happen. And I found that very few people were talking about the fact that that's what we do. We make change happen. And you can't make change happen unless you can see the other person. You don't get to say to people, do it because I said so. You have mm -hmm. to talk to them in a way that they can hear you and that they evolve and engage to go to the next place. And, and, and like the empathy side of things, like that's always deep in your messages. Where does that stem from? Well, empathy is a really tricky word. It's possible to allow empathy to paralyze us because you can't possibly know what it's like to be someone else. You don't know what they know. You don't want what they want. You don't see what they see. How dare you put yourself in their shoes? And there are a lot of people, arch capitalists, for example, who say you shouldn't put yourself in anyone's shoes, that everyone should make selfish decisions and that's the end of it. And I don't buy it. I, I, I've been on the receiving end of empathic help and I know people who have. And given the choice, most people would like to be seen and they would like to be understood and they would like to feel connected. So if I'm privileged enough to not be drowning and not be starving, well then, I'd rather be a lifeguard. And what it means to be a lifeguard is that even if you're not drowning, you could imagine what it might be like. And maybe you should throw that person a life preserver. Yeah. So are you saying that compassion is maybe a better word? 
Yeah, I, the, the story I tell on This Is Marketing is imagine the world's greatest comedian. If you're a Seinfeld fan, it's Jerry Seinfeld. And he goes to, to a, perform at a club and he's given his best material and he's trying really hard and no one's laughing. He's <laughs> just bombing. And afterwards he finds out, well, everyone in the audience was from a tour group from Italy and no one spoke English. <laughs> so whose fault is this? Well, I think it's the fault of the booking agent. The booking agent shouldn't have put an English speaking comedian with an Italian speaking audience. Now you don't have to have compassion for the Italian speaking audience, but you should care enough to know that it's not going to work. And that's the way I feel about education and connection, which is I don't feel sorry for people. What I feel is if you are going where I'm going, if you want what I am describing, if you're enrolled in this journey, let's go. And if you're not, well, more power to you, but I'm not here for you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Makes a lot of sense. Now, Seth, there, you're talking about change and, and the right way and the wrong way to do things. There's, there are a lot of cowboys out there, you know, trying to make a quick buck. Uh, what has sort of inspired you to make the change of the narrative within mar the marketing industry? Yeah, so the marketing industry is two industries. There's one industry that's filled with narcissistic, egomaniacal, selfish, short-term marketers who don't care about anyone else and are ripping people off all day, every day, because they can and they think they deserve it. I wish I could keep those people from calling themselves marketers because I don't think that's marketing. And then there's a second group of people, people who win Nobel Prizes and people who build businesses for the ages and people who do things that feel like they should get paid for it but don't get paid and people who weave together important work. Those people I call marketers because they are seeking to make a change happen that the recipient is glad is happening. They're not tricking people and they're not pushing anyone against their will. And those are the people who I think could use a little cheerleading and support because we need more of them. And those are my people. Yeah. You have a nice line. I think in, uh, in the, your latest book, it's uh, marketing is a generous act of helping someone solve a problem. And yeah, that's uh, that sort of ties in nicely with what you just said there. So Seth, just something that's really fascinating for us when, uh, when we read all of your materials and you know, this latest book that you have out now, you always have very interesting examples and, and you could even say sometimes they're like a little bit obscure. So a couple of the ones, well, actually one is from one of your talks that you do about sliced bread and sliced bread not becoming sort of famous for its first 15 years of its life. And then there's other one about uh, the Penguin Magic Company, uh, which does reviews. And then another one, which is the Open Heart Project of online meditation teachers. So we're just wondering, like, what do you read to find all these examples? You must, <laughs> where do you get them from? Well, I, I will tell you my secret. It's pretty easy. It used to be rare to do what I do, but now everyone with a smartphone does it, which is we're just engaging with stuff in the world all the time, constantly. And the only difference between me and most people is I am looking for examples. When I see something that doesn't make sense or that surprises me or that feels like it hooks into something I'm trying to teach, I write it down, I remember it. And now I have that example to use years and years later. So if I'm sitting there watching, you know, I, I like to tell the story of a, a neighbor, a kid who was growing up wanted to be an actor, a comedian. And he gets to college and he goes to the tryouts for the improv troupe. And there are 11 slots available on the improv troupe lineup. And he comes in 12th. And he's heartbroken, he's crestfallen. And I say to him, why don't you start your own improv troupe? Because the irony of it was not lost on me. That you, that you want to do improv, but you want to do it in a group where that picks you. <laughs> you don't want to just improv that. And as I said it to him, I said, this is the story I'm going to use 100 times. <laughs> because it gets right to the heart of one of the things I want to teach. And I'm glad I didn't have to make the story up. Because if I was the kind of person who makes stories up, I would make up that story. Because it's exact, it's memorable and you get it and you could imagine yourself in those shoes. So when I read about Otto Rowetter, I don't know, six clicks into Wikipedia one day, 
I'm like, you mean someone invented sliced bread? <laughs> now, <laughs> once you're on that thing, then I'm like, well, now that I got the sliced bread guy, I got to find some story in here so I can talk about the sliced bread guy. And so that's how I spend my day. I'm unemployed. I don't go to meetings. I don't have a TV. I just spend my day looking for another story like that. <laughs> uh, their story, human beings are just full of stories if you're willing to take a moment to to dig a little deeper and to listen, like you say. And, and so it's all around us. You mentioned um, heart a moment ago. And um, I'd also like to ask you about brain. So you often discuss the lizard brain. And, you know, I think it can be a little confusing for some people, maybe if they're not sure how sure. that all works. What, what is that all about? And why is it so important to understand our sort of deeper neurological workings? All right, so let's consider the unicorn, right? So if we look at a unicorn's brain, what we see is that it's probably three times bigger than the brain of a squirrel, but a third the size of our brain. And what happens with animals as their brains get bigger is we add the stuff that gives us narration. We add the stuff that lets us do a coloring book or brush our teeth, right? But the core brain never changes. We have the same base brain as a squirrel and a unicorn and a hedgehog and a koala bear. And that brain is about this big, the size of a US quarter. And it's got in it two little lobes. And what those lobes are directly connected to is our spinal column. Their only job is reproduction, fear, rage, running away, survival. That's all they worry about. They have no idea who won the football game. They have no idea what the weather is like. They just want those things to happen. But when they get activated, they go straight to our spinal column. It's only about this far it has to go. As a result, the rest of your brain, the one that's saying, no, 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 I'm just at a movie. Don't worry, it's not a real shark. That part of our brain is three seconds behind. <laughs> and that's why people enjoy going to horror movies because there's this mismatch going on in their brain. <laughs> part of their brain thinks they're going to die and part of the brain knows they're not going to die. And that mismatch makes some people happy. So the reason we have to understand it is if your lizard brain is getting triggered, you can't talk your body out of it. It's too late. You have to acknowledge that it's happening and maybe figure out how to put it to good use. So when someone says at the end of a talk, does anyone have any questions? Almost no one raises their hand. Why <laughs> is that? Because the act of raising your hand in public activates the lizard brain. And people don't want to experience that feeling, so they sit there until the end of the talk and then they run up to ask the speaker a question. Because that doesn't activate the lizard brain. So once you know that that's what's on offer, you can do a few things. One thing you can do is when it gets activated, you can say, oh, there it goes again, and not try to fight it, because it's too late to fight it. But you can dance with it. Mm -hmm. The other thing you can do is you can treat it like a compass, so that you can say, ah, if my lizard brain is activated, that must mean something's going on. Hmm. And, and how do you engage with that? Sorry, sorry, buddy. Carry on. You, no, it's, it's easier said than done, though, isn't it? Of course it is. Of course it is. This, so, you know, we, we hear about performers who had stage fright their whole career. They never made the stage fright go away, but they cared enough about their work mm. to live with it. And all of Buddhism, all of most organized spirituality is about how do we deal with the chemicals running through our body to exert emotional labor, to keep ourselves from doing the thing those chemicals are telling us to do. In this case, run away screaming. And uh, so if you want to be a professional, the first step is to stop listening to your lizard brain. Wow. But know it's there and be aware of it. How do you, what are your techniques for yourself with, for, for understanding the way you function? Do you spend some time meditating a little bit or what are the, your techniques for your own lizard brain? Yeah, I, I meditate. I'm a sloppy meditator. I should not be held up as an example for anyone. <laughs> um, but I have worked very hard to realize the narrator in my head is unrelated to anything I actually do. So you can't make the narrator go away either, but you don't have to take him so seriously. But for me, 
you know, if, if I was a marathon runner and you said, do you get tired when you run a marathon? And I was telling you the truth, I would say yes. So the trick is not to not get tired. The trick is where do you put the tired? And in my case, when I'm feeling the fear of don't publish that post, don't write that book, don't launch that project, I say to myself, oh, you just gave yourself away. I'm onto something now. Thank you for letting me know I'm about to do something important. I will listen to you by doing exactly the opposite of what you just asked me to do. And that dialogue monologue with my lizard brain helps me smile at it as opposed to try to fight it because it can't be fought. And Seth, do you ever get like fearful about anything in life, like going onto stage or, you know, like you said, now you sometimes might not post something. Are there oh, I get, examples? I get afraid all the time, but only if I'm doing good work. Mm-hmm. Right. When I'm, when I'm not doing good work, it's, it's worthless and there's no fear either. So that's a, sing, a symptom to me that I better get back to work. So, so can you just explain that a little bit more? Like why only when you, are doing good work? Well, because if I'm sleepy at walking my way through my day, right? A Sunday afternoon for two hours where nothing much is being created, where I'm not open to any criticism, where everything I'm doing is going to work. I'm like, yeah, no, no lizard brain. But if 14 people are coming over for dinner tomorrow night and I'm making a dish I've never made before, <laughs> the lizard shows up and he's saying, yeah, you should play it safe. Make what you made last week. So I'm still present as a person. I'm not at my day job. But in that moment, I feel more alive than if I'm making yet another batch of brown rice. <laughs> and, and is cooking something you actually like doing? Yeah, I've been uh, cooking for the family every night for the last uh, 25 years. Wow. Okay, oh, wow. that's amazing. <laughs> So you're not uh, tempted to go on like MasterChef or anything like that? <laughs> yeah, I don't have a TV. So I would have to uh, first learn why people want to watch that on TV. Uh, I once published a recipe in the back of the book, Survival is Not Enough. I posted the recipe for my crispy tofu. Uh, <laughs> but while people tell me they like my cooking, I don't think it's cookbook worthy. <laughs> <laughs> and, and do you find that um, that downtime or the the not being in the fight or flight sort of state, let's say, is important for our brains or for us is to be creative? I think it depends on who you are and what you do. Um, I know that I can go for very long stretches and be very productive. Uh, I used to be able to do it even more than now. And my biggest fear was vacation. I didn't know how to have vacation. It just didn't restore me. It made me frustrated. Uh, Mm. Over time, I think I'm backing off a little bit on that theory. But there are other people who go away for a week, a month, or a year, and then there's this flow of ideas that come from it. So I'm not sure. I, I don't believe that recharging our brain is much more difficult than recharging our muscles from a physiological point of view, I do believe that if you fall in love with a story about the fear, you can paralyze it and it might take months to unparalyze your creativity. And for that reason, I think a sabbatical may make perfect sense. Seth, you mentioned now like about sort of working a lot. So what, what is your secret? Because you, you produce a hell of a lot, I guess, of, of content, of courses, podcasts, you name it. Like, how do you do so much? You know, I don't understand how other people don't. I have a very tiny team. I write every word myself. I don't have meetings, so that helps me. That saves me hours a day. But mostly, I've developed this habit of shipping. So I don't think I'm working harder than other people. I just think I'm censoring myself less than other people. So I'll work on a blog post and work on a blog post, but then it's tomorrow. It's got to go live. And the people who blog once every three months, their blog posts are longer than mine, but word for word, I'm not sure they're better than mine. They're just longer. So I love those blog posts too, but I don't think we need to believe that the work with our fingertips and of creativity is similar 
to the work of building the Brooklyn Bridge. Dozens of people died building the, the Brooklyn Bridge. It was a feat of engineering that required millions of dollars of materials. That's not a blog post. That's not even a book. That's a whole other kind of project. So if we're lucky enough to work on our own, I don't think we should tell ourselves the story, the lizard-enabled resistance, as Steve Pressfield would call it, story of this is actually really difficult. I think it's scary, and the best way through the fear is to do the work. <laughs> and, and, and another thing that uh, is like a sort of big feature of yours and, and probably ties in nicely with, with sort of putting out a lot of work is feedback. And by like doing all the work you're doing, you get feedback quickly. So what is the importance of feedback? And also, how do you give good feedback? Okay, well, a few things. First of all, in the Alt-MBA, which is the workshop we run, people give and get more feedback than they've gotten in their entire career, usually in 30 days. They're giving people deliberate, constructive, helpful advice and getting it in return over and over and over again. And that's part of the game changing of the event. But leaving that aside, I would say that most people get lousy feedback, that asking people for feedback is a mistake. It makes way more sense to ask for advice than feedback. But most of the advice you're gonna get are from people who are trying to save you from yourself, from people who don't want you to get hurt. So they'll tell you back off, don't ship that, you went too far. But those aren't your people, that's not who you made it for. That advice and helpful feedback from people who are on the same journey, that's priceless. It's really hard to find. If you can't find that, don't take any, right? I, 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 have, I stopped reading my Amazon reviews five years ago and it hasn't hurt me one bit. In fact, it's helped me. I've never met an author who said, I read all my one star reviews and now I'm a better author. You're never gonna write that book again. You don't need this review. And the person who's giving you a one star bit of review, they're not on the journey you're on. There are one star reviews for To Kill a Mockingbird. There are one star reviews for Harry Potter. You should be as lucky as those people. So I think feedback is overrated unless you're getting it from the right people from the right reason. Wow. Now, now Seth, you mentioned the Alt MBA and tell me, this is an interesting thing. You've done an, uh, sort of a, let's say a stock standard MBA. What is different with Alt Alt MBA and, and what makes it so special? Uh, and do you think people shouldn't do a normal MBA? Okay, so we'll go backwards. I wrote a column 15 years ago about uh, how the MBA for anyone who doesn't go to a super famous school and want to end up in a consulting firm or an investment bank is almost certainly a waste of a quarter of a million US dollars. It takes two years, it costs a fortune, and it's based on an old model of industrial compliance. And so yes, there's certainly as a signaling strategy for certain industries, can't beat it. But for almost everyone else, I don't think it's a good idea. 13 years later, 10 years later, I built the Alt MBA. And the idea of the Alt MBA, first of all, is I'm not in it. There's no videos from me. It's not about paying money to watch Seth Godin or to interact with him. Mostly it's projects. And the stuff we teach in the projects isn't the Black-Scholes option pricing model. It isn't microeconomics or macroeconomic theory. It's not most of the stuff they waste your time with in business school. We teach people how to see. We teach them how to lead. And we teach them to make decisions. And those three things, they don't teach in business school. So that's why the all part is so much important to the MBA part. And what happens is at the end of a month, when people leave, they say, I never knew I could get so much done. And they say, I never knew I had this much power. I never knew I had this much ability to influence other people. And that's why we build it, right? The, the typical online course has a 4% completion rate and we have a 97% completion rate <laughs> because we're holding people to their promises and we are seeing them and connecting them and we'll keep running it as long as we can make that kind of impact for people. 
Well, I've certainly seen um, Gareth, uh, who's done your course, uh, uh, certainly make big strides in, in, in sort of his own um, focus and strategy. So it's, from the outside, it's, it's really great to see. So it does definitely work. In, <laughs> hey, Gareth. Yeah, absolutely. Like we actually, we had thoughts about doing the podcast um, before I started the LTMBA. And then one of my projects in the LTMBA was actually, right, let's get the podcast off the ground. And that was using Zig Ziglar's goal setting uh, technique, seven, his seven steps. And it was really like an absolute game changer. So we have a lot to thank for, you know, for you and for the LTMBA. Well, that's fantastic. Love hearing that. Yeah, for sure. And I mean, how many people have actually gone through it now? Because there's a hell of a lot. I mean, I think I was 12, but now I see there's, there's like you up to number 18 or even more. We're in the 20s. I think we have 2,600 alumni in 45 <laughs> countries. Wow, that's amazing. And what else has like come out of the LTMBA? Anything else? Does it like, you know, have there been some really great stories that you sort of, you know, sort of got your ear to or anything like that? Well, one guy, um, a week after he finished, they made him the CEO of his company. Wow. Uh, a few people have quit their jobs or ended their relationships. Other people have started new jobs and begun relationships. Sheila, who is in her 80s, took it from the Isle of Man uh, wow. outside of the UK or in the UK. And she felt totally re-energized and invigorated. We've had people who one of the tech leads for the Smashing Pumpkins rock group went through it. We've had people from Chobani and Amazon. What we hear is that they ask better questions, not that they always know the answer. And that's thrilling to me because I had no desire to create thousands of people who know the answer, but plenty of people who can ask better questions, that's really valuable. Yeah. And, and does it excite you about how like education is changing? Cause for me, this was like such a prolific course and it was so engaging and really made a huge difference, you know, compared to going to a lecture hall somewhere. So are you like excited about the way education is going? Do you have a sort of thoughts on the future of education? Well, I'm an optimist deep down, but right this minute, education is in trouble because as it transitions, as always happens, the forces of the status quo get angrier and louder. So at least in my country, there's even more work being done to get kids to take standardized tests, to get mm. teachers to be held to the standardized tests, even though there's almost no data that the standardized tests lead to anything. But because we can measure it, we are measuring it. So I believe that many of the higher education institutions we grew up with will be out of business in 15 years, bankrupt. Mm. And so something's gonna take its place. And my hope is that this virtuous cycle of peer-to-peer -peer enabled by a connection will take its place. But we don't even realize how pervasive education is in our lives. It's mm. the thing more humans have done for more hours for the first 20 years of their life than anything else. And this method was invented by industrialists to train kids to do what they are told. And so why are we surprised that adults want to do what they're told? But in a world in revolution, doing what you're told is overrated. Yeah. And, and, and just coming back to the education, I mean, there's, what about youngsters? You know, I mean, I can understand uh, slightly older. Do you think there's a definitely a place for homeschooling then or, or some kind of structure for, for young kids? Yeah, so I think all schooling is homeschooling in the sense that from three o'clock in the afternoon until bedtime, somebody at home is schooling you. Mm. And a lot of parents have done a terrible job of that uh, mm. because the requirements for what it means to be an alert contributor in our society don't match what they would teach the typical kid growing up on the farm. They needed to be a pillar of the community, absolutely, but the number of things they had to know how to do was very small. So mm. I'm not sure that homeschooling is the answer, particularly since I love public school. I want kids to be 
like this with each other, even kids who don't look like them, even kids from different economic mm -hmm. backgrounds. That's got to be our future. But I do think that, that Sal Khan and others are correct, that what we ought to do is have homework consist of watching the best videos in the world on every topic, and school be doing your homework with the teacher. Mm -hmm. Because if I can have a kid watch the best organic chemistry lesson ever made and then come in and do the organic chemistry homework with me, mm -hmm. that respects the teacher more than requiring him to put on a once in a lifetime performance every single day mm -hmm. on yet another topic. How do they do that? doesn't make any sense. So that shift I think is inevitable. And then we got to get, figure out how to test the right thing and not just make standardized tests work. And see if, I think a lot of people are kind of worried at the moment about, you know, what their kids are going to do in the future with all this sort of rampant change in technology. So sure. what are your thoughts on it and what would you advise those parents or those kids to study? Well, I think it's pretty simple. If you work on an uninteresting problem, it's going to get done by someone cheaper than you, either a robot or someone in another land. And so don't learn how to solve uninteresting problems. You know, something as elegant as radiology. It turns out that computers can read x-rays better than almost any radiologist now. And for the ones they can't, the radiologist doesn't have to be in the room. The x-ray is digital. Send it to the best radiologist in the world. So spending a million dollars to become a radiologist makes no sense. Solving interesting problems, on the other hand, meaning problems for which there is no answer yet, we're going to have a hard time teaching computers to do that. So I think what we've got to teach parents to teach kids to do is not something where you can look in the back of the book and tell me what the answer is. We've got to teach them to write a poem, edit Wikipedia, have a blog, figure out how to lead a community organization, go raise money for charity, figure out how to build houses for Habitat, da 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 Right? There's an endless list of interesting problems. And it turns out once you get good at it, solving interesting problems, you can keep doing it. Yeah, that's for sure. And, and sorry, Seth, you've obviously got a new book coming out. And before we get onto that, um, I just got one, one question about your blog. Do you have like a treasure chest of blog articles stored away and you kind of just drip feed them every single day? Or do you sit down... Uh, you know, once a week and write them? How does the process work for you? It's all of the above. Every night I work on tomorrow's blog post, huh? but I get viruses all the time. So if I'm in bed with a fever, there's still a blog post that's going to show up because what's the point of being Lou Gehrig if you can't keep your streak going? So I'm <laughs> quite happy to work on it every day, but make sure the very best thing I've got is always ready. Yeah. Cool. So, so talking about books, I mean, obviously, like I said, we want to get onto your new book, but just before we get there, you, you've you written, obviously, many, many books, uh, Seth, and, you know, um, why write another one? Like, what is the impetus for, yeah. you've got so much great content. It's a great question, and the answer is I have no choice. It's, you know, it's been years, literally years since I wrote a full-length prose book, more than five, probably. But sometimes an idea comes along that will not let itself go with just a seminar, even if it's expensive and time consuming, like the marketing seminar. You know, that works, 6,500 people have taken it, it's transformative. But a lot of people say, I won't pay $600, I just wanna read the book. And a blog post wouldn't have done it. So I say, all right, I'll devote months of my life or years of my life to putting this into a handy package that you can hand to other people. And that last part is critical. Because if you're on a team of six, and all six of you read this book, it will work better than if one of you reads the book. And so I'm happy to play in other forms of media. I love other forms of media, that's why I blog. But every once in a while, I have no choice. They make me make a book. <laughs> <laughs> That's interesting. And, and you, you said you have, you know, you enjoy lots of forms of media. What's actually your favorite? Do you have a favorite? Because you've done great talks. You have your podcast. You obviously write a lot. Yeah, I think it comes and goes. The, the podcast has been thrilling. Akimbo is up to episode 30 or so. 
And I like playing with a new form of media to figure it out. Uh, the blog is like an old friend. It's been going on now for more than 20 years. So I'm not going to stop that. And I enjoy that feeling. Uh, and then the video lectures that I've been doing in the marketing seminar, I love those. I, every once in a while I'll go back and I'll watch them because I learned something from me, which seems bizarre. <laughs> so all of those things. I have no interest in doing well-produced traditional TV with the multi-camera thing. Like that, that just seems like a waste to me. So all of these have in common is I'm doing it myself. I'm just weaving together these little pieces and I know it's not as fancy as I could make it. And I know it's not as polished as it could be, but that's on purpose. And Seth, you talk about the, the marketing seminar and Craig and I were actually uh, thinking of doing it a few months ago, but we kind of missed one of the cutoffs. Um, what, can you tell us a little bit about it and like why people should do it? Well, as I'm demonstrating for $19, you can buy everything I know about marketing. Or if you have time on your hands, you can read 7,000 blog posts for free. So what's the point of paying? It's not to hold the videos hostage, right? The videos are fine. But what I do is every two days, I tee up an idea for about seven minutes. And then the group discusses it. They do it as homework. They publish it. People give them feedback. And over the course of 100 days, if you're doing the work in public in this safe setting, your mind will change. Hmm. Excuse me. Your mind will change. That's very rare. It's very rare to watch a TED Talk and have it change your mind. It's very rare to read a book and have it change your mind. It's this feedback and the connection in the community. That's magic. So I'm the bait. I'm the bait to get you there. <laughs> but what really works is the community. Yeah, for sure. I think that that community is so strong, like, you know, for mark, the marketing seminar for the LTMBA, it really drives people and makes them, you know, make those changes and sort of come out their shells too, you know, and, and produce stuff. That's the goal. And I'm committed to it. I mean, there are other easier ways I could spend my day, but this is working better than anything I've ever done. Oh, that's so cool to hear. Oh. So we've actually been lucky enough to get our hands on your uh, latest book. So thanks a lot for sharing it with us. And then yeah. we both, uh, we both read it like a lot of, a large amount of it. Some of the things that we, you know, that sort of stood out, there's one, there's one thing earlier on where you speak about marketing driven and market driven. Can you just maybe explain that a little more? And then off the back of that, can you tell us, can these both go hand in hand too? Yeah, I learned the term from George Mayfarth in 1983. And I was talking about a job I wanted to get and that it was a marketing driven company. And he said, well, what that means is they are driven by spending money on ads and conferences and doing what the marketing department says. He says, you'd be much better off in a market driven company. In a market driven company, the engineers and the lawyers and everybody is listening to the market. And they realize that what they do isn't to someone, it's for them and with them. So if we are market driven, we are way more likely to be resilient and to be aware of those we serve. Whereas marketing driven means we go to con, we buy a bunch of ads, we get to drive around in a limo. I'm not interested in marketing driven. There are companies, I'll put Nike on this list, that are marketing driven in that the marketing department runs the whole company, but are also market driven in that they are aware of what the market wants, what they believe and what they need. Wow. That makes a lot of sense. So, so, so it comes back to, to people again and, and that deeper understanding of, of what makes them tick and focusing on people and the human nature again. But Early on in the book, you also spoke about um, this idea that people are lonely and, and want to be seen and known. Does that tie in there? It, do, it absolutely does. Because if we weren't lonely and we weren't thirsty for the new, no one would ever watch a commercial. No one would ever go to a trade show. No one would ever care about what's next. Because we're seeking fulfillment and meaning and opportunity and connection through the stuff we engage in. So if you show up 
and say, I am here for you. I see you. I want what you want, or at least I want to help you get what you want. People will go, do that more. <laughs> and given that we can't control attention like we used to, what choice do we have? We have to have the humility to say to other people, I made this for you. I hope it resonates. Seth, I think a lot of people say like maybe when they're starting a business uh, or just, I don't know, yeah, starting a business, let's say, they find it maybe a bit overwhelming. And one of the things you talk about is uh, finding the smallest viable market and I guess also your tribe. What is the importance of, of that? Well, in the short run, it may sound less overwhelming. I hope when I'm done, people will realize it's more overwhelming. So let me explain. In the old industrial model, once you had a factory up and running, the goal was to have the factory as busy as possible. It's the only way you could pay for it. So you need the biggest possible market. You need to make mayonnaise or ketchup. You need to sell you know, the most popular item on the high street because otherwise you'll fall behind on your rent. But now that you don't have to pay rent, now that everyone's connected digitally, trying to please everyone will never work. You have to please the smallest viable number of people. Because if you can obsess about them and say, you 82 people, it's for you. I'm going to please all 82 of you. Now you're on the hook. Now you don't, you don't get to say to those 82 people, well, you don't like it. There's something wrong with you. Because you got to pick which 82 people. Mm. And if the 82 perfect people don't like it, you're toast. If they love it, they'll tell their friends. And now you have 164 people. Right, and you have 328 people, and then you have 656 people. It right? goes and goes and goes. So you begin by delighting the few on your path to organically growing to the people who can't wait to hear from you. Wow, that makes a lot of sense. <laughs> but with with regards to communicating to your people, right? You obviously talking about a smaller number of people, but you also discuss the long tail in terms of the communication. So how do those two tie in together and what is the significance of a, of a long tail? Okay, so Chris Anderson wrote about this. In the big market, the market for records, the market for books, there's some hits, short head, and then just as many total of the long tail. So if we look on the iTunes store, you could buy Jamaican polka music. Now, not very many people want Jamaican polka music, but if you wanted it, you could find it. And his argument was that owning a business that sells everything is smart. Well, people laughed at him, but he was right. Netflix, iTunes, Amazon, that's all they do. They sell everything. That's the secret. But if you're not one of those people and you live way out on the long tail, you've got a problem. And this is where the word viable comes in. Because if you look at the Apple Store, perhaps 10% of the songs on the Apple Store last year sold zero. Hmm. That's as long as the long tail can get, zero. Hmm. So if you're somebody whose market way out of the long tail is to sell zero or one or two tracks, that's not enough. So my argument is that that's not going to do it. You're going to have to find a slice of the long tail where there's enough people to sustain you, for you to sustain them, that they connect with one another. That becomes a new market. And within that market, there's a long tail, right? It's fractal. But let's not worry about that. Let's worry about which group of people see themselves in you. And the two examples in the book are the Grateful Dead and Harley Davidson, right? So the Grateful Dead in the United States, number one touring band of all bands mm -hmm. for more than 10 years. They had exactly one top 40 hit in their 50 year career, one, mm -hmm. and it almost ruined them. That they didn't win because they won at the short head, they win because they owned a, a sizable chunk of the long tail and that was enough. And you actually have another good example like that. I, I think I heard it on Akimbo where you talk about your own blog actually. And you said that something like none of your blog posts have ever been one of the most famous ones ever. However, all of them kind of do pretty well. 
and that's the, that's a long tail for you. What was the example there exactly? Yeah, I've, I've never won the internet. I've never had the hot post of the day. I've never had a post where millions of people came to visit my blog. Now you would think with 7,000 tries, that would happen. It hasn't, and it's fine with me. I'm not going for that. But when you look at how people find out about it and then they forward it to someone and then they come back and they forward it. So the first year, I was getting three or 400 visits a day. That's all. But you just double that every once in a while and then you have one of the most popular blogs in the world. So when people say, well, that's easy for you to do, you're Seth Godin. Yeah, but what did I do to be Seth Godin? I just showed up and I showed up and I showed up. It's, there's no magic here. And I'm happy to give away whatever secrets you think I may have. This is just about writing for the people you seek to serve, doing it in a way that's easy for them to share, and then doing it again tomorrow. Does it make you feel proud, like what you've achieved, I guess, in terms of your blog and everything else? You know, my English teacher wrote in my yearbook from high school that I was the bane of her existence and that I would never <laughs> amount to anything. And uh, about 15 years later, I dedicated a book to her. <laughs> <laughs> and I mailed it to her. And ever since then, <laughs> I have taken no pleasure whatsoever in proving anybody wrong. <laughs> it's not, I mean, it was slightly fun for a little while, but it gets old and it sort of eats away at you. So I am not doing this work to show anybody anything. And so, no, I don't feel pride about this. Mostly I feel an obligation that I worked so hard to be able to be able to whisper to people to make this promise that I don't want to let them down. Mm, that's cool. And, and Seth, what is the importance of storytelling in marketing? Right? We don't actually walk over to someone with a sword and cut their hand off. We tell them a story. And every interaction we have with every customer is a story. It might be the way the hot sauce tastes, maybe the billboard on the bus, maybe what my friend told me about what happened with you. These are all stories. Maybe they remind us of our childhood. Maybe they remind us of our parents. Maybe they remind us of work. But stories within stories that lead to connections in our brain. It's all we do. So when I say story, I don't mean once upon a time. I just mean hints and clues that when added up, make us get to the point where we believe something else. Okay, cool. Yeah. You, you mentioned um, you know, stories there and you also talk about ideas that um, spread when. Right. What does that mean? It means that if you think about what is the job of a gene in a creature, it's to have a lot of grandchildren. That's how evolution works. If the genes lead to grandchildren, they worked. And if they don't, they didn't. And they get spread. Well, ideas are a lot like genes. And if we think about the memetics of how ideas work, an idea that spreads through the desired population and sticks is by definition a good idea. It might not be good for society, it might not be good for those that are hosting the idea, but as in terms of its function, as an idea that spread, it proved itself. Just like the flu is a good germ because it's good at being a virus, right? And so if you, you know, I, I wrote a book about this called Unleashing the Idea Virus, it's free. And it's good. How do I know? Because 4 million people have touched it. And the reason they've touched it is because one of the things that you will do after you read this free ebook is you're going to send it to other people. That's its function, right? And so when we think about how are we going to show up in an industry and make a change happen, we begin with an idea that can spread from person to person because the idea can go faster and farther than the object itself. And, and does that spreading, does that tie into funneling at all, what you talk about in your book? Well, how to decode this. So you and the three of us are talking on a piece of software called Zoom. How did you find out about Zoom? Did you find out about it from a TV ad they ran? Probably not. You found out about it because someone wanted to talk to you on Zoom, but they couldn't talk to you on Zoom without telling you about Zoom. And so built into Zoom is the engine of Zoom spreading. That's a virus. Well, once you get to a certain point, 
it's going to slow down its spread. And that's when the funnel kicks in. The funnel says, if I'm going to buy any ads online, I'm putting attention at the top. And along the way, I'm making offers to people. Maybe you're a free Zoom customer. So now you're halfway down the funnel. But then you need one of the features that you have to pay for. So you move further down the funnel, right? And so direct marketers think very much about a leaky funnel. How do I earn attention at the top? How do I create customers at the bottom so I have enough money to do it again? And the reason I bring up funnels in the book is because you should not spend a dollar online on any boosting or ads or promotion unless you understand your funnel map. Okay. So you, you're not like against things like click funnels unless you really understand it. If you're doing it for the right reason, it makes perfect sense. I am not proposing that marketers run around with their eyes closed. What I'm saying is if you're building a squeeze page to manipulate people into sending you money, if you're not proud of it, don't do it. But if you are proud of it, because at the end of that journey, they are changed in a way they want to do be changed, then you're a good marketer. So, yeah. so in terms of talking about manipulation there, do you r consciously write something that you think might spread? Is that your thought process? Or is it that you just have good ideas that tend to spread? No, I disciplined myself to create a writing style that would spread. And that's been true for all of history. That any author you have ever heard of, you have heard of them because someone who read it decided to publish it. And someone who bought it decided to tell someone else. And you can write for yourself, feel free, but then you're not a professional. If you're going to write for other people, you need to write for them in a way that will spread. Mm. Seth, we, we've read um, so many books in our lives and, and two of them have been pretty recent in terms of changing our minds on marketing and storytelling. Uh, one of them is by a guy called Donald Miller, um, the, called Creating a Story Brand. Uh, sure. another, one, another one is actually by a guy called Russell Branson, um, Expert Secrets. And then... One that has really helped us on our journey is your book called The Dip. Um, and it's just helped us always sort of reassess things and go, this is meant to be difficult, just push through, you know? So it's been re really helpful for yeah. us. So thank you. Do, do you have any favorite books of your own and of other ones that you've read? Well, I would add to that list, The War of Art and The um, Art of Possibility. Two books mm -hmm. that really rewired the way I thought about difficult problems. Uh, I recommend those books all the time. Uh, in terms of books on this topic, I've posted many long lists in the back of This Is Marketing is another list of 20 or 30. Bernadette G was book. If you like Donald's book, I think Bernadette's books will really resonate with you. Uh, but I'm uncomfortable saying this is my definitive list because mm -hmm. it keeps changing. Okay. And what about of your own books there that, that you think, you know, this, I really enjoyed writing this and I really enjoyed sort of putting it out there. Yeah, that's, it's so hard because I have not um, come to the point where I want to disavow any one of the 19 books I've written. There are tools okay. that go in a toolkit. So I loved creating what to do when it's your turn. I love publishing that book. Survival is not enough The Second or third book I wrote, didn't sell any copies. I'm super fond of that. Lynchpin is the best book I've ever written. I can never write another book as good as Lynchpin. So it's all over. And um, I hope if it was worth me writing it, it's worth someone reading it. But I don't know where you should start. <laughs> you, you, you published something recently about your different methods of writing books. And there's no like, you know, specific format that you have. The one that you that you mentioned, um, I actually sorry, I can't remember the name of it, but it was one the one that you did the most research on. Like you spent a year researching it, and it was like one of your your sort of lowest selling books. So, um, what what are your different methods then? If you have a few, well, you know, yes, yeah, survival is not enough. Involved six hours of research a day. Uh, the dip 
and Unleashing the Idea Virus, I wrote each one of those in two weeks because I had something to say and I write like I talk. Um, so it's all over the map. You know, in the case of This Is Marketing, I had this uh, group of 6,000 people who have taken the seminar five times. So each time I'm watching what's resonating and I'm getting to see in real time, oh, that worked. Oh, they didn't understand this story. So that book, by the time I got to the writing the book part, it was the easiest book ever because I had already practiced it in front of people in a form that felt like a book. Then when I finished it, I rewrote a third of it because I wanted it to be more difficult for me to write and to get under people's skin even more. So that's the book we ended up with. Interesting. And, and so some, something that's like interesting that you said now is like you, you said you talk how you write and it's interesting because like you, you say what you mean, there's no fluff and then that's it. Cool. Done. <laughs> has, has that always been your way? Well, when you set out to be a writer, I think you have one of two choices. Either you have a writing voice and you make it as artful and complicated and perfect as possible, or you learn how to talk better. And if you can mm. learn how to talk better, then the writing part is the easy part. And I chose the second path. Cool. Love that. Well, it's been an amazing chat. Uh, and it's that time of the day where you, we have to ask someone how they can get hold of you. And the reality is uh, you're definitely not hard to get hold of, but how can people <laughs> get in contact with you? Well, I put up uh, some sample cop, uh, excerpts from the book and a video at sets.blog slash TIM. And uh, I'm easy to find on the internet. Just type Seth into your favorite search engine. The marketing seminar is at themarketingseminar.com and the Alt MBA is at altmba.com. So sooner or later, you're going to find me. It might not be for you, but if you're looking for me, here I am. <laughs> That's cool. And um, Seth, is there anything else like that you can talk about uh, that is coming up besides your book? Well, I want to take my time instead to talk about the two of you. Uh, it's not easy to do the work you're doing. It's thankless work a lot of the time. It's scary work. And I, for one, am grateful that you're here and that you're leaving and you're making these connections. So I hope you keep doing it. Getting to episode 1,000 takes a long time, but you should persist. <laughs> wow. It means so much. It really means so much. I didn't expect <laughs> that at all. So thank you so much. Um, Seth, it's honestly been an honor to talk to you. Uh, thank you for responding to our request to be on the show so quickly, which was literally like, you know, 15 minutes and then a week later we're chatting. Um, you're a real inspiration to, to definitely to myself and I'm sure to Craig as well. Uh, you, you have basically helped us start this podcast and uh, we're so happy that uh, you're part of our journey and part of this. So, you know, and thanks for everything you do. It really does shift our own perspective and open up our own minds. So it's been a real pleasure. Well, you're very kind. We'll see you later. And just Thank briefly you. from my side, yes. I just want to quickly say, uh, it sounds really cheap coming from us, but keep doing what you're doing too, uh, <laughs> because it does mean so much uh, to us every day. Uh, thank you so much for your time. And uh, we look forward to all the great stuff that you're busy with. Thank you. Thanks, guys. We'll see you later. Take care. Cheers, cheers. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Cheers. Bye. Waking at dawn, packing the gear, September tour, and up in the air. Stop at the toll, digging for change, snow weekend.